Okay, here we go. Buongiorno and welcome, uh, uh, Professor Bartov, Omer Bartov, uh, to this uh, humble place. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Uh, you'll forgive me if I do a brief introduction in Italian, then we'll switch to our working language. Okay. Allora, buongiorno a tutti. Ciao. Uh, come vedete qui con noi, il Professor Omer Bartov. Omer è professore di storia e di origini israeliane. Finalmente qualcuno che ha un paio d'anni più di me. Let's see if he gets the joke. Uh, I said finally somebody with a couple of years more than me, but not so many. So, um, Omer is an historian of World War II and then of the uh, genocide issue. Actually, among historians, if I'm not correct, uh, your controversial work, controversial, you know, the work that created the debate is about the political nature of the Wehrmacht, correct? Right. Uh, allora, è ovviamente, ed è considerato una delle persone al mondo che più uh, diciamo così, ha studiato con autorità questioni di cui oggi si dibatte da un altro punto di vista, um, la, soprattutto il genocidio della popolazione ebraica europea per parte delle, dei nazisti anzitutto e di altri, e, però essendo cittadino di origine israeliana interessato alla questione è anche una figura autorevole nel campo. Useremo l'inglese, so get ready. Ok, so thanks Omer for your patience. Let's get straight to the point and get rid of it. There is this uh, uh, semi-legal formal debate if what's going on in Gaza and around Gaza resembles or does not resemble, can be qualified or cannot be qualified, should be called or should not be called, is it offensive to call it, is that... Uh, bias to call it a genocide or an attempted genocide uh, of a population. What's your view? So first, uh, thanks for having me in your studio. Um, my view is that first of all, now, uh, the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, is actually uh, adjudicating this issue. Uh, to fully adjudicate it, uh, this panel of distinguished judges will have to take a long time, but for now, they issued uh, provisional measures uh, on the basis of the plausibility of there being genocide. So clearly, uh, the ICJ, which is the uh, highest court in the world, thinks that there's plausibility, whether they will finally determined that it is or it is not, in my view, depends not only on what uh, happened until now, but what will happen in the coming weeks and months. Uh, that is whether the actions by the Israeli military and the Israeli government um, lead toward uh, the removal of the population of Gaza from the Gaza Strip or will make it impossible for them to return to their homes uh, and therefore deepen the humanitarian crisis on the ground, uh, which is already quite profound, uh, which would lead to, to even uh, greater loss uh, of life. Uh, right now we are talking about uh, approximately 32,000 people uh, dead and probably far more, many thousands buried under the debris and the numbers keep rising. Uh, now for genocide, as you know, you need to <clears throat> determine two elements. One is intention and the other is implementation of that intention. 
and that intent is the intent to destroy a particular group as such. Uh, and so to my mind, there is sufficient evidence, at least as far as we can tell, that there have been war crimes, uh, likely crimes against humanity. Those do not necessitate establishing uh, intent. Uh, but only seeing events on the ground and whether we could eventually say that this was, will be, or was already also a genocidal action, as I say, will need a little bit of time to determine that. I, I would just say that it's important for us because we use the term genocide often loosely to understand that the only definition that matters uh, under international law is the definition of the genocide resolution of 1948, um, and that um, the use of the term is often, um, it's used often much more loosely uh, for political reasons uh, or propaganda reasons. Um, and it makes people think that war crimes or crimes against humanity are not as bad as genocide. But of course, uh, there is nothing particularly positive about uh, war crimes or crimes against humanity, even if they ultimately do not rise to the level of genocide under international law. Right, thanks. Um, and about that, uh, two issue. How do you think, uh, I will try to be as, 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 as journalist-like as possible today. Um, actually, you will forgive me, I will try to push you a bit, even if I tend, having read some of your opinion on this and other stuff that you have written in the past, uh, to share your views, but let me try to push. Uh, how are you going to judge intentionality in all this? What is, how do we, yes, do I, I understand, fine, uh, acts on the ground determine uh, war crimes and, and uh, another form of illegal and uh, immoral behavior, but how do we go after and how do you establish your view that this is intentional about genocide? And the numbers, uh, there's been yeah. people raising a lot of questions. Um, about numbers. Numbers are all reported by Hamas authorities, which, by the way, suggest that uh, the alleged intention, but yet I'm going against my role, of destroying Hamas hasn't functioned very well so far. Uh, and our question, uh, I myself had to spend some time uh, dismounting a ridiculous piece of zero statistic coming from Wharton, uh, together with other colleagues. But uh, from the historian point of view, how do you trust the numbers? How do you think uh, we should uh, go after trying to make them reliable? So you you asked about two things. First, uh, intention. How do you determine intention? And then how do you determine numbers? In terms of intention, the, the easiest way to determine intention is if people with executive power express that intention. Uh, often in genocide, they don't do that. Uh, in the case of uh, Israel, um, there were political leaders um, uh, with executive authority, as well as people in the military, who actually used genocidal language already quite early on uh, in October. And I already wrote about it in early November. Um, so uh, expressions such as wiping out, flattening, uh, cutting off supplies, uh, letting the people die, that all the people in Gaza, human animals, that um, there is no difference between Hamas and, 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 and other Gazans and so forth. All of this rhetoric was actually used uh, already early on. Uh, the question is whether that language was um, then translated into policy uh, on the ground. Um, we have to also understand that when you use this kind of language and you have executive authority and standing within the population and among your soldiers, then that language can be seen as incitement. And incitement to genocide itself is a crime. Uh, so it isn't that um, uh, language was not used. It was then also denied and, and the idea for saying, no, that's not what it, it is doing. So there was a little bit of ambiguity on that. Uh, but what is difficult to establish then is the connection between the language, which can be portrayed as only empty rhetoric and propaganda, uh, and actions on the ground. And that's difficult to do. And often, unfortunately, one will be able to establish it only after the fact, because then you have you, you need access to documentation, to orders being issued, and so forth. Uh, but that is why I think 
uh, the ICJ correctly spoke about plausibility uh, because it knew that it cannot determine finally whether it is or it isn't genocide in time to stop the killing. Now, obviously, its uh, provisional measures didn't really help much because Israel actually uh, does not seem to have abided by any of that. So that's the the first question. On the Absolutely. question of numbers, yeah. numbers. Yeah, I mean, on the question of numbers. Look, the, I I have to say that up to now, and that not for the first time because in 2014 we had a similar case. Uh, the numbers provided by the Hamas-led uh, Ministry of Health, as it's usually described, uh, have turned out to be quite accurate. Uh, and the the U.S. State Department seems to accept them. And in fact, the Israeli army and Israeli authorities seem to accept them as reliable. Uh, now, how reliable can they be under the circumstances? I suspect that they're not uh, precise and numbers are never precise. And people who use precise numbers, even historically, are usually just wrong. Uh, but by and large, they seem to be correct. Where the numbers, in fact, are more suspect, I would say, and have historically been more suspect, is the so-called body count. Uh, by the IDF. You can go back to Vietnam and talk about the U.S. Army body count. So militaries tend to exaggerate the number of combatants that they kill. Uh, and it's very hard to bring them to account on that. And by and large, I think it seems to me that the IDF is exaggerating the number uh, of the Hamas militants it is killing so as to try to justify the uh, high count of civilian deaths. But even the IDF itself said and, 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 and tapped itself on, on the shoulder for saying that uh, for, for every militant killed, they only killed three civilians, which for some reason they think is a good count, which is how you get to 32,000. And I think they're probably um, uh, understating the ratio. That is that the ratio is worse than that. And finally, as you said or hinted, uh, clearly, not only was October 7th a huge fiasco for the Israeli army, and we can talk about it, but the operation, which has been going on now for five months, has not accomplished the goals that it stated. It, it has not freed uh, the hostages. It freed three at uh, the most. Uh, and it has not destroyed the leadership or the combat abilities of Hamas, although it's diminished them. Uh, and you talk about an army that recruited originally some 360,000 um, reservists, uh, has modern tanks, modern aircraft, modern artillery, uh, and it's fighting at the most 40,000 likely armed militants. So the operation itself, and I think the Americans are certainly uh, saying that, uh, has been a failure. Uh, and all it's accomplished was an enormous amount of destruction of human lives and, of course, of property. Omer, thanks. Lisa, let's jump uh, backward about 80 years on time. Uh, instead of going backward from October 7, if you have to look at it with the classical tool we silly theoretical economists look at, uh, at the world uh, when we're doing theory and pretend to be a benevolent planner, how would you fix the screw up of the Brits and of the newly formed United Nation between end of war 46, 1946 and well start or end of Nakba 1949. That is what in your view are the political and uh, eventually or even if you want to expose where people are aware or not, I will I will spare you my, my view of what took place in those uh, four uh, three and a half crucial years. So you're asking me to uh, propose another historical course for what happened? No, I'm not. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want. I'm not asking you for some crazy counterfactual. I'm, I'm going I'm yeah. to ask yeah. you to see. That's the origin of it. There is no doubt. Yes, I understand right. there is the background, the Zionist movement, the responsibility of the Europeans, uh, the tremendous responsibility of all the Europeans in creating the uh, the Jewish tragedy and and so on. Uh, but without going, the, 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 the start of the Nakba, in some sense, the, the fathers and grandfathers of some of the poor people that are now mm -hmm. dying in Gaza, or even of the people that committed the atrocities of uh, October 7 and 8, uh, 
was there was in those uh, 700, yes. 800, 900 displaced people uh, 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 from, uh, uh, you know, the, let's call it Palestinian villages and, uh, and the way that uh, strange war took place and, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, I'm not going to try to express my view. My view is that, the, that it's, a, it's a very a serious uh, Western, uh, British in first, but then also of the other uh, winners of World War II responsibility of having created the situation. But, but uh, I want to hear your view, honestly. Well, look, I mean, this is this is a very complicated story um, and and there are, there's sufficient uh, guilt and responsibility to go around uh, for everyone. Um, I, I would say if we try to think more constructively about the events that happened in 47, 48, 49 and subsequently, uh, I think we can we can say that um, the the creation of the Palestinian refugee question, as Benny Morris called it, uh, was a result of a war uh, and a result of a Zionist uh, goal, which had been expressed long before, of creating a Jewish majority state. Um, that was accomplished by uh, Israeli forces through military victory and through uh, flight uh, and expulsion of about 750,000 Palestinians. Uh, whether that could have happened differently, um, I, I don't know whether uh, it, it's useful to discuss that because you would have to go back to the 1930s and think very differently of policies, the mandatory policies, policies of Palestinian leaders, of Jewish Zionist leaders, and I don't know that that's very useful. But I think where we can say something that might be useful is that following uh, the ceasefire agreement, the refusal by Israeli authorities, uh, by the new Jewish state, to entertain any possibility of a return and compensation for the refugees. Maybe not all of them, maybe in all kinds of compromises, but the utter refusal to entertain that possibility. There were very few who returned, but by and large, uh, most were not allowed to return and vast numbers of villages, uh, well over 400 were destroyed. Uh, that, that um, uh, stubborn attitude by the Israeli state uh, is what actually created the problem. And had that been, and there were people at the time who, who spoke about it, uh, uh, about resolving this issue differently. I think that would have made a difference. And that you can then translate into a subsequent episode because that occurs for a second time in 1967, when Israel has the so-called bargaining chips, it has conquered the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and it says, okay, maybe we can use them to get peace, and then it says, well, actually, why don't we try to keep them? And that can be translated into what the War of 1973, which whose main cause is Israel's refusal to return the gas at the Sinai Peninsula uh, in return for peace with Egypt. And that can be translated also into what happens in 2023, which is based on Israel's utter refusal to actually try to reach some kind of political process uh, with the Palestinians today. So. I think that trajectory you, you can see from 1948 to this day. Yeah, I know it's going to be difficult. I have, I have to try. I, I do agree. And if I, 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 you can confirm, we never talked about this. And, uh, uh, but people that have been listening to me in the last few months uh, are being repeatedly saying that that's the birth of the thing, the refusal to allow the return. And then not using the uh, conquered territories uh, to to close uh, 
in some sense to close the deal. There are two problems for, with this story. Um, the Palestinians on one hand, both in 48, 49, apart from a uh, uh, small uh, and not well-functioning association that were birthed a few years before and really did not have the structure of a state or the ability of the capability of being a state, have uh, always claimed, uh, some say rhetorically, some say uh, because that's what they want and that uh, they've always been like Hamas, uh, that they want the, destru uh, the destruction of uh, the Zionist entity, as it used to be called and it's still called. And the Arab states have not played an active role in uh, creating a, a reliable and credible and functioning Palestinian authorities. On the other hand, says the argument, the Israeli did try eventually. Yes, okay, it was late. Could have been done uh, 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 almost 60 years before, but in 2005, uh, Sharon um, did uh, give freedom to Gaza. They had uh, they had a piece of land <coughs> where. <clears throat> What's your view of this uh, of this uh, narrative? Well, sadly, not the case of Sharon. Uh, Sharon was was totally uninterested in peace. What what he thought was a that um, keeping large numbers of Israeli troops within Gaza to protect very small numbers of settlers who were really behaving there like colonists, taking over large parts of the, the uh, territory of Gaza uh, and had to be protected constantly by large numbers of troops, that that was indefensible. This was one thing. The second thing that he thought, uh, and that takes you back uh, also to the peace accord with Egypt uh, by Menachem Begin was what he wanted to do was to keep the West Bank. Uh, just as Begin ultimately when he signed... Let me interrupt you there, Iraq. Omar. Let's, let's take advantage yeah. of this for a second. Do you think they want to keep the West Bank or there's just some extremist uh, religious fanatics? Is there a, a theory about that? What's your view? If they? Who, who do you mean by they? <laughs> Well, the current Israeli government, uh, and I would say the majority of the political forces, given that uh, mm. West Bank has been under Israeli right. control, as you pointed out correctly, since 1967, before it was under Jordanian right. control. And, uh, um, well, right. there were so, some yes. promises in the Rabin period to give back mm. some trade. But other than that, uh, I would say, so the they is the majority of the political forces. Yes, look, I mean, I think that uh, during the uh, negotiations over the Oslo Accords, uh, the, the form, there was a growing part of public opinion, uh, both among Israeli Jews and among Palestinians, that one could find a political arrangement between, arrangement between the two groups that would uh, mean uh, Israel giving up much of the territory of the West Bank and of Gaza, and creating a Palestinian state there of some sort. And I think that because there was a political horizon of doing that, more and more people actually supported it. And at the time, Rabin, who was, you know, this militant general and all that, uh, was pushing for that. And people, to an extent, trusted him. Of course, there was a huge amount of opposition led by Benjamin Netanyahu, which in large part led to Rabin's assassination, which I have called the, the most successful assassination in the 20th century. Uh, it, it, it sealed uh, any prospects of peace for, for decades to come, as we are seeing now. Uh, right now, yes, so the Israeli government has no interest in any negotiation over the West Bank. How representative is that government? Um, that is hard to say, because I think right now, Israeli public opinion is mostly swayed by what happened on October 7th. There's a very sort of strong sentiment of revenge and, and, and fear and insecurity and rage and so forth. But I think that if this uh, leadership, the, the extremists in this leadership, uh, putting Netanyahu aside, the, the Smotrich and Ben Gvir part of the cabinet, I would say represent probably 20 to 30% of the population. So I think that there is a large part of the population which under particular conditions would like to change that state of things. And I think it's the same among Palestinians. The problem is that both groups are being led by extremist groups, which are very similar in many ways. They want the same thing, 
they want to establish these kind of fanatical religious intolerant regimes from the Jordan to the sea and as much as they can kick out the other group. Uh, they don't, I don't think they represent the majority, but they, they drive the majority into situations of such despair and rage. Does that remind you of any other country you and I live in? <clears throat> it does, it does. And I just <laughs> hope, you know, uh, because if things uh, go that way in the United States, then, then this will have uh, a much greater impact on the world than what is going on in Israel and Gaza. Uh, this, this will be uh, a, a general political catastrophe with, with the huge ramifications. Uh, but we don't know yet. I, I don't know where it's going. And there are many differences, of course, between the state of things here in the US yeah, and in Israel. I was, I was, on, I was half joking. Uh, back to the issue. But the Arabs in all this, the Arab states, uh, Egypt, uh, uh, what's the reason? in particular, uh, uh, Jordan and Egypt, which are, uh, uh, forget Syria for a moment because of their ambiguous history and then uh, uh, the, the strong relation with Russia. Uh, by the way, we should get to what's going on at the United Nations, what kind of game is being played there, uh, if you have a moment. But, but that, in, that eventually uh, signed peace treaty with, uh, with uh, uh, Israel. Uh, what you think are the motivation for their not operating to create a reliable Palestinian authority? Is that something uh, profoundly wrong and, 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 and unadjustable with the Palestinian community? Or is that some other reason? Is that, that the widespread emergence of Islamic fundamentalism? What, what is it? Why do we have this uh, crazy situation of a corrupt octogenarian co Pseudo power uh, in the West Bank and uh, Hamas. Um, let's forget the fact that Israel played a huge role, that in fact Sharon and Netanyahu played a huge role in the emergence and the growth of Hamas. I think this is clear enough mm. and need not be further documented. But in any case, Hamas does exist uh, as operated in a certain way and so on. So why is it uh, those two both? clearly not reliable uh, uh, heads, the only uh, representative of the Palestinian community. I know dozens of Palestinians around the world here in the United States that are, you know, even, forget about our colleagues, some, but even, uh, you know, business people, normal people, they seem of a completely different nature. I myself in Italy have been involved helping a Palestinian financier that lives in Rome uh, to raise funds. By the way, uh, let me take the opportunity to remind everybody, please donate for the fellowship for the Gaza girls at the at the uh, College of the Adriatic. You'll find the, the video here on the channel and with all the, the indications. So th there is a civil society that is different in the Palestinian world. Why the Arab countries have an interest not to foster it? Well, I mean, you, you're asking a complex question because it has to do both. I know, I'm the, taking advantage of you. Yeah, so it has to do both, first of all, with the case of the Palestinians specifically in Arab countries more generally, and then it is a situation that has changed over time, and where we are now is very different from where we were 30, 40 years ago. Uh, so to sort of cut to the chase, I would say that right now, there is an interest in the Arab world, uh, setting Syria aside, as you said, uh, in Jordan, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, there is an interest to uh, have a proper diplomatic, political, uh, economic uh, cooperation between Israel and these major Arab states. Uh, until uh, October 7th, um, it appeared to most of these leaders, including, of course, uh, the Israeli leadership, the, the Palestinian issue could be swept under the rug. And the Palestinian issue has always been a problem for um, uh, these um, authoritarian uh, Arab rulers because a large parts of the population are influenced uh, by the, uh, first of all, uh, Islamic groups and generally by sympathy uh, for the Palestinians. Uh, and these are not, as far as we know, not particularly popular uh, rulers, they rule because of force, but they have an interest. 
now after October 7th, uh, it has become clear that the desire to have a political arrangement uh, with Israel exists. And that, you know, can take you all the way back to <clears throat> uh, Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky's idea of the Iron War. Uh, in, in some ways, he was right. Uh, Israel managed uh, over decades to establish itself as uh, an inevitable entity in the Middle East. It has been accepted by most Arab states that it is there to stay. Uh, and that's what these leaders have now accepted. But it has refused to deal with the, a major issue, uh, which may appear as a marginal issue, but when, because there are 14 million people living between the Jordan and the sea, and 7 million of them are Palestinian, without resolving that issue, Israel itself as a society has been deeply undermined by that, uh, morally, uh, security-wise, culturally, uh, and it has refused to address this issue. And I think that today, uh, um, most Arab countries would be, including, of course, the Gulf states, would be delighted if there were an option to resolve this issue because it would make things easier for them and it would make open up the option of relations with Israel, repair the now... Um, and why don't they do it? Why they're not an active... Uh, 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 I understand the Jordanian kingdom dreamt for decades to control uh, cheese Jordania or West Bank. Yeah, uh, well, they they gave up on that, but they, they didn't have they, deals on that. Yeah, but. yeah, but but they can't force Israel uh, to change its relationship with the Palestinians. The the only powers that can do that uh, are first of all the United States, and secondly the Europeans, the, the EU. Uh, and so Israel... let's get on this then. Then let's get on this uh, mm -hmm. because I don't want. I know you have to go in about twenty minutes, and I don't want to. Uh, We'll get to the European second. Uh, you're one of the first people that I consider expert on the field that says the European can play a role. I tend to say I had a discussion on this with Romano Prodi, former prime minister of Italy and head of the uh, European uh, Commission. And Romano it says, ah, we have no power, blah, blah, blah. I, I disagree. So I want to hear your opinion on that. But what's going on at the United Nations? Why are do we uh, do we have to face this... Uh, uh, let me say, obscene ballet of uh, uh, blocking any resolution that called for a ceasefire from the Security Council on the issue of linking or not linking it to the hostage release. And uh, uh, so the news here is that Russia and China have blocked the, U the United States resolution because it uh, makes the ceasefire conditional on the release of hostages and vice versa, whereas they want to ask for the two as independent act to the two parts. Uh, what's your view? Well, look, I mean, the, as I was saying earlier, the, the only country that has real leverage over Israel, immediate leverage, uh, both diplomatic and military is the United States. Uh, the, the United States is supplying a vast amount of munitions every day uh, to the uh, IDF. The IDF can actually not operate right now without these constant supplies. And of course, it gives Israel political coverage uh, in the Security Council. Um, the, I, I'm not here to defend the politics of Russia or China. That's obviously not, uh, these, these are not uh, positive players and they have their own interests. But the United States could, in fact, uh, influence Israeli policy more than it does. And unfortunately, I, I have to say, I think that the administration has actually said the right things, but it hasn't enforced them. And it has allowed Netanyahu to play again into American domestic politics to the extent that now the Republicans can present themselves as defenders of Israeli safety and Netanyahu can sit around waiting for potentially a President Trump. Whether Trump would be any better for him, I don't know, but at least he can stay alive until then. And like all people of that sort, any month that he can stay in power is okay. We'll see later what happens. Um, 
So I, I think the main issue here is for the United States first to form a real clear-headed strategy, not only for a ceasefire, but for a political resolution, for a process of politics. And, and they clearly yeah. don't have, you know, uh, they clearly don't have. The, you know, they keep actually thinking that Abu Mazen is, uh, now they're talking, uh, but it's mostly from Israeli side, they're showing some willingness to finally reduce the famine that is clearly taking place in the refugee camps in right. the south of the Gaza Strip. And there are talks in the international uh, news sources of some not yet clearly uh, identified Palestinian uh, organizations supported by uh, the Arab states uh, in the Gulf that should manage this distribution of, uh, of food yeah. instead of Hamas. Uh, which it's sounds, not going to work. Yeah, it's it sounds work. utterly, yeah. utterly, utterly, uh, you know, uh, insane no, no, and impossible you, given the circumstances. Yeah. No, you need the, the, the Palestinian Authority uh, to um, be revamped, as they call it, and to become engaged in what's happening in Gaza, but as an interim phase, and the, the US has spoken about it, but as I say, has not articulated clearly and has not enforced it. What, what you need to do is to stop the fighting. Uh, you need to uh, find a mechanism to remove the leadership of Hamas from Gaza. And I don't think that's uh, impossible to exile them to wherever. Uh, you need well, to- The real leadership in... is already self-exile in Qatar, apparently, right? No, but there is a leadership no? on the ground someplace. I don't yeah, know yeah, no, where where they are, uh, if they're actually there, but I suspect they are there. Uh, you need to remove them, um, send them off to exile someplace, join their friends in Qatar or wherever. Uh, you need to bring in an international force, a, a, a strong and, 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 and well-organized international force that would be mostly made up of Arab countries. Uh, Saudi soldiers or Egyptian soldiers or Jordanian or whatever it is, to establish uh, initial order in that area with the IDF out of there and not using these sort of family heads, uh, uh, patriarchs, criminal organizations in Gaza. That's not a way to do anything there. That's just to make it into Somalia. Uh, and then all of that has to be done under an understanding that this is the first stage toward a resolution of the conflict, which would create two states, a state in Gaza and the West Bank. How do you think they're going to create two states? I mean, let, let me stop you. There is, I mean, uh, the only an impos a military imposition, uh, we get to Europe here now. It is my view. I'll be brutal. I know mm -hmm. it's a pie in the sky. Uh, but on the other end, the situation is as brutal and as uh, hard to conceive that... Uh, Solution are only buying the sky. Either there is a military presence, a, a strong military presence mm -hmm. by European forces on the ground that clear up what's left uh, usable of the West Bank and create some corridor in some form or some form of connection with the Gaza area, which is to be completely reconstructed uh, with a gigantic investment, uh, comparable probably to what, uh, well, probably smaller, but of the same order of magnitudes than what will be necessary in Ukraine. Or there is absolutely no hope other than pursuing what you, I think, at the beginning of this conversation correctly said, is an ongoing tentative of genocide uh, that will continue in its various no. forms. Um, yeah, I so mean, that's where I see their role. But what's your view of the, of the European Union and its complete passivity and inability to even think about this? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I can't say much about Italy, but I can tell you that 20% uh, of the military supplies going to Israel are coming from Germany. Uh, and Germany is, is a major player. Uh, and Germany, together with Italy, Britain, and the UK, uh, can, in fact, in cooperation with the United States, uh, try to enforce an arrangement. I can't say for sure how many European troops and how many Egyptian troops, and I don't know exactly how that would work, and that would be a very complex thing to negotiate. I'm not sure. I don't think Americans would want to have any boots on the ground, and I'm not sure that you, Europeans would like that, but maybe in some kind of um, uh, supervisory role or logistical role for sure. Uh, but that has to be done together with the European Union, not only uh, for uh, political reasons, 
but because we are not only speaking about uh, the possibility of there actually being genocide right there and even larger and larger numbers of, of dead, we're also talking about a region that at any moment can completely disintegrate. Uh, the, the, the war in the north, the militias in Syria, the Houthis and the Iranians, all of this can at any moment get entirely out of control. And that would harm the EU, it would harm the United States, it would harm the world economy, uh, and it would be almost impossible to control once this starts, this snowball starts rolling. And the, the passivity and the timidity of Western powers up to now um, is, as you're suggesting, is certainly also responsible for this. They have to become much more active uh, in, in a positive way for the good, not only of the Palestinians, but also if they really care about the state of, the state of Israel, which I care about, uh, they have to uh, force it to move in the right direction. Right now, Israeli policies are uh, harming Israeli national interests on a daily basis. And this government has not resolved any crisis whatsoever. It's in fact deepening it on a daily basis. Um, and and at, the, at the core of this is a political leadership, Netanyahu, who, whose main interest right now is to continue the war because only that will keep him in power. He is deeply unpopular. So that's your reading. He wants the war because he wants to stay in power. Uh, yes. His speech clearly have all these biblical references. I know in one of your New York Times article you pointed out too, I had made reference to the city of Sin right after the attack by Hamas and Sodom and yeah. Gomorrah. And that was clearly his intention. Uh, does he mean it or is it just, uh, you know, the guy probably a lot infinitely better than I do. And I'm always wonder, is he just a, a semi-fanatic believer in the Jabotinsky and so on theories of the revisionist uh, Zionist movement? Or is he just a bloody cold businessman? that has made a gigantic business of its political enterprise and knows where, you know, pull and, and push and uh, which messages to send be, because he needs the people behind. Which, which one of the two are we facing? Well, actually, it's a combination of the two, and these are questions that have been asked. Yeah, I mean, people ask that about many authoritarian leaders. Are they just power hungry or do they have some ideology? He has both. You can actually compare that to people like Putin and others. He does have an ideology. Uh, he's, he's not exactly where Jabotinsky is because he's really anti-democratic by now. And Jabotinsky believed in parliamentary rule as, as it begging, and Netanyahu does not anymore. Uh, but he is ideologically driven. He's also extremely cynical, power hungry, and he is thinking that he's either in power or potentially in jail. And there's, that's a very good incentive to stay in power at any price, never mind how much blood is shed of your own people, let alone of Palestinians. Uh, okay, so let, let's, let's go back and try to close up. Um, if you had to forecast uh, uh, what's gonna happen in the next few months, are they gonna attack Rafa? Uh, is, is something going to happen because of the American elections? Because I suspect in the American election, this is going to become uh, a more and more visible issue. Uh, Biden is yeah. clearly embarrassed uh, by the thing. And one has to admit, I, I suppose you know, of uh, the old fellow called John Marshmeyer at the University of Chicago. Uh, he's been accused of uh, anti-Semitism and so on for his work on the so-called Israeli lobby. But you probably know that word uh, uh, as well as, uh, as John does, certainly better than me. What's your view? Do they play a role or is it something different here in the United States, which is purely looking at, in my opinion, ill-conceived because the, the same way that the passivity of the European Union uh, damages uh, the European Union itself, I think that the strategic choice of the United States damages in the global world. But so is it a, a matter of the lobby or is it a matter of uh, uh, long held strategic choices of the United States in that area? Well, I mean, the, the, there are two issues here, I, I'd say. First of all, in terms of the so-called Jewish lobby, I think 
Yes, there, there are. Israeli lobby, not Jewish. I mean, uh, well, that's that's what. Nershan there is some identification, yeah. but not necessarily yeah. all of it. Well, but it is a Jewish lobby. It's not an Israeli lobby. It's uh, it's made of American Jews, not Israeli Jews. So, uh, right, but, you know, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, fine. that's what it is, uh, and 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 it sees itself as such. Uh, so there is there, there there are people in the United States, uh, uh, well organized, uh, politically influential. And their political lobby, like many other lobbies in the United States, the whole system of American politics is based on lobbies, not not just Jews, but many, many others. Uh, and they have an influence and their influence, I think, has been uh, in recent times uh, not good uh, for uh, Israeli politics. They, they think it is, and I think they're wrong. And it has had a role also in university politics, as you probably know, with what happens with university presidents recently and so forth. So there is that, and some of these people are big donors also for the Democratic Party as well as to universities, and so they have some power. I think the dynamic, however, is moving in the other direction. The dynamic in the Democratic Party and the dynamic among American Jews and leadership uh, in Jewish communities, and certainly among the young generation, is a growing frustration with Israel, anger against Israel, um, uh, disappointment, uh, a sense of betrayal. Uh, and I think that in the long run, Israel is losing its uh, influence in the United States and in American politics. Uh, so even if you look at it from that point of view, and that's in answer to your first question, uh, I think it's going in exactly the wrong way. And uh, if you think that uh, Israel can trust the kind of people who are behind Trump, many of whom are actually anti-Semitic, uh, with credentials of anti-Semitism, then I think that um, you are really uh, betting on the wrong horse. The second thing is what will happen uh, in the near future and the long term future. I think we don't know whether there will be an attack on Rafa or not. I'm, I'm not sure the Israeli army is even capable of doing it right now. Uh, and certainly not. Why if, do you say uh, so? Why am I saying so? Because it. it of doing it. You you have to understand that the, there were two fiascos uh, since October 7th. One was the fiasco of October 7th, uh, which was a, a disaster, a military disaster. Uh, first of all, I mean, it takes you 90 minutes to drive from Tel Aviv to Kibbutz Be'eri, uh, and it took uh, the army eight hours to get there. Uh, that's, that's a total fiasco. But the second is the Israeli operation. It's been fighting for five months. Uh, with vast numbers of soldiers and artillery and tanks, and it does not accomplish its goals. So it, whether it can actually go into Rafa, deal with the fact that there are well over a million people there, concentrated there, without any means to support themselves even now, uh, and somehow root out Hamas and have a total victory, as Netanyahu says, I don't know that they can do it. I'm not sure they want to do it right now. I think they actually, the Israeli military would actually like a pause just for its own reasons. Uh, there is exhaustion among the troops. Uh, so I'm, I'm not even sure that they can, but whether they go in or not, what I would say is that Israel can, can head in two directions. One is that it will become, over the next few years, a pariah state. It'll become poorer, it'll become more violent internally, more and more violence internal between Jews and Jews, and between Jews and uh, Palestinians or Israeli citizens, uh, um, 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 many people leaving the country, the country becoming increasingly authoritarian and isolated. And it can live like that. You know, we, we've seen countries living like that for decades. Uh, eventually, it will implode. But that's one option. And it's, it's a possibility. And the other possibility is that the country, first of all, from within, but with help by its so-called friends, by European countries and the United States, will be helped to go in another direction, which has to be settling finally this issue of ruling over millions of people increasingly brutally in an oppressive, violent manner. If it does not do that, that's the way it's heading, and it'll end up like South Africa. Well, on these words uh, that unfortunately I consider prophetic, so uh, 
I have had discussion with some of my Israeli friends since the time of Kellogg back in the early 90s about this. So I, I have a hard time trying to uh, tell you you're wrong. Uh, I, I would like you to be wrong, but... Um, me too. I, I, yeah, I, I understand you more than me. Uh, Omer, uh, I, let me thank you for your time. Thank uh, you very much. I uh, hope uh, we keep in touch and uh, the, maybe in, uh, let's see how things go. And uh, thanks, thanks again and uh, have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. <clears throat> allora, uh, grazie Omer di nuovo. E, e, niente. Um, non, uh, non credo abbia bisogno di traduzioni, comunque ci sono i sottotitoli e potete, potete cercare di utilizzare quelli uh, se non capite bene l'inglese. Uh, sì, io personalmente uh, non me l'aspettavo così tanto, uh, avendo una conoscenza relativamente decente delle sue valutazioni, delle, anche delle sue enorme uh, oggettività, devo dire, credo che da, da israeliano e da ebreo per lui non siano facili. Queste affermazioni, um, uh, beh, dic- mettiamola così, di fronte alla pochezza di cose che vedo sui social italiani, del dibattito italiano, di tanti, anche accademici purtroppo, anche accademici, o ex accademici, o aspiranti accademici e accademiche che tali non sono diventate, e la loro mancanza uh, non solo di umanità, ma anche di capacità oggettiva di guardare i fatti, uh, Credo che la sofferta tranquillità con cui un uomo come Bartov uh, uh, riesce a, uh, a riflettere su questo uh, possa essere di insegnamento a quelli che vorrebbero fare i professori, ma fanno solo i galoppini e i diffusori di odio. Um, per quanto riguarda i sottotitoli, credo appaiano, vengono messi disponibili dalla... Ma, vengono me- anzi, senza credo, vengono messi disponibili dall'artificial intelligence di di YouTube, dal software di YouTube, dopo che il video è stato processed uh, uh, sia per uh, la qualità della, delle immagini, sia per il testo e il vocale. Quindi ci vorrà un po' di tempo. Niente, vi ringrazio, vi prego di mettere i like, in questo caso sono importanti, vi prego di diffondere il più possibile, poi chi uh, volesse anche seguire altre riflessioni su questo si abboni e così... Eh, eh, cosa. Oh, vedo che gentilmente Matteo Salvemini si offre addirittura di mettere i sottotitoli in italiano, un lavoraccio, ma uh, è ovviamente benvenuto, quindi forse spunteranno anche i sottotitoli in italiano se Matteo gentilmente trova il tempo. Um, ritornerò sull'argomento, ho in programma di tornare sull'argomento con delle valutazioni mie, e a questo punto credo cercherò altri storici, altre persone, vediamo se becco Benny Morris in questi giorni. Uh, e altri, comunque ritornerò sull'argomento domenica nel vostro uh, tardo pomeriggio sera uh, per riflettere sulla questione di sionismo eh, e semitismo o antisionismo antisemitismo e per riflettere sulla domanda che volevo fare a Omer ma mancava il tempo so che avevo un faculty meeting ce l'ho anch'io fra, fra poco uh, e quindi <coughs> lui a Brown quindi da lui erano le quasi le, sono quasi le 11 da me sono le 10 di mattina da lui sono quasi le 11 su questa ridicola controversia che vedo di nuovo in Italia eh, eh, venire utilizzata sullo slogan palestinese o dei ragazzi palestinesi from, uh, dal fiume al mare from, uh, from the river to the sea Palestina will be free Palest- uh, Palestine will be free uh, uh, e gli analoghi slogan israeliani molto più antichi a cui lui ha fatto riferimento è significativo il fatto che abbia detto che eh, Jabotinsky era meno peggio di questi, questi sono peggio. Uh, uh, C'è cioè, un dettaglio appunto che io non mi sarei sentito di dire, ma l'ha detto, uh, l'ha detto, l'ha detto Omer. Va bene, signori, uh, grazie e, e ripeto, cercate di, di fare circolare. Se ci fossero persone più degne, anche che hanno opinioni diverse e che hanno il coraggio del confronto, come c'era una persona come Bartov, come ce l'ho io, forse si ridurrebbe il tasso di, di odio e di violenza. E certo va detto, uh, se ci fossero alcuni di questi che si agitano uh, con, uh, che vengono regolarmente attaccati, l'Italia anche ha ragione per, il loro, uh, per la forma folclorica e, e estrema e controproducente di sostenere il popolo palestino, 
palestinese. Vorrei capire cosa li spinge a questi comportamenti uh, francamente dannosi, ma uh, niente, non, uh, non aggiungiamo altro. Grazie a tutti e un abbraccio a tutti. Ciao ciao, buona giornata, buona serata anzi.